But there's little more than things that, that really, you know, than, than the power of encouragement. You know, we need to hear it, and, uh, you know, we need to hear it personally. We need to give it to others. Uh, but just to hear how God is encouraging you is something that warms my heart tremendously. So thank you again for sharing. All right, we're, we are into the book of Ezra this week. So for those of you, if you have not been along for much of the journey, we've been journeying through uh, the Bible this year. And so we are all the way up to, excuse me, Nehemiah said Ezra, but Nehemiah um, today. And so we're going to touch a little bit on Ezra to begin this morning before we jump in, because those two stories are very interconnected. Um, but today my message is on unity, teamwork, and encouragement. So Nehemiah chapter 3, uh, we're gonna, we'll get to the passages here, or passages in just a little bit. So, uh, In the book of Ezra, which we talked a little bit on last Sunday, we were informed that there was a remnant of, of Jews who had come back out of captivity and they had returned to Jerusalem. And not only that, they arrived with the full support of the Persian king Cyrus. However, when we open up the book of Nehemiah, what we learn is that Nehemiah was not amongst that original group that returned back to Jerusalem. In fact, in chapter 1, we read that Nehemiah was the chief cupbearer to the king. Now, this was a position of high nobility, but not without its risks. If you don't know much about the chief cupbearer, his responsibility was to take the first drink from the king's cup so that if anyone sought to poison the king, the king would not be poisoned. Now, in chapter 1, what we read is a situation where Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, comes back from Jerusalem. So remember, this group has already gone to Jerusalem. They've seen the status of the city. And they realize how in despair that city is. And so they return, a group of them, looking for more help. Now, Nehemiah receives a report that the exiles have indeed returned safely. It wasn't like nowadays where someone, you know, my parents, when they come out here, then they, they go back and they go back to Michigan, and by that evening or the next morning, I get a report, oh, we're back safely doesn't work that way, or didn't work that way. So he's probably on pins and needles waiting to hear what's happened with those that return. But he also is saddened by the news that the future is uncertain because the walls around the city were all broken down, and all the gates had been burned. So Nehemiah has a decision to make. On one hand, he has this not perfectly safe, but cushy job where he is in the palace. And on the other hand, is the welfare of his people back in Jerusalem. Maybe not an easy decision for some of us if we were in that position. But for Nehemiah, it was easy. Now he goes before, in chapter 2, the king, King Artaxerxes. For the first time, Artaxerxes sees something in Nehemiah that's out of place. Now this king wisely recognized that something wasn't right. And he expresses compassion. And this was not normal, but he allowed Nehemiah the opportunity to freely speak what was on his heart. The reality was that Nehemiah, what must have been running through Nehemiah's mind was that there were protocols and processes with which these conversations happen in the presence of a king. Yet not only did Artaxerxes listen, he allowed Nehemiah to go clearly because he had come to entrust Nehemiah with his life. So Artaxerxes not only lets him go, but he also provides letters so as to guarantee safe passage. And even further, he offers or he gives 
monies for timber to rebuild the walls. Now that may not seem that big of a deal until we remind ourselves that this is the very people whom destroyed Jerusalem prior. They had taken the Jews into captivity, but now we find them giving freely supplies to rebuild it. This is clearly the hand of God. And so Nehemiah sets off back to his homeland. Now upon arrival in the city, he does what any good builder would do. He examines the walls and the gates with his own eyes. He'd heard the reports, but he needed to see it for himself to determine what needed to be done and how best to do it. But once he did that, he didn't linger. He acted and moved forward. And so with all of that context in mind, we're going to turn to our passage. Now, I'm not going to read to you all of chapter 3, because as you read through it, it's a long list of the names, and I think I'm going to give you the first seven verses. That's going to give you enough to paint the picture if you have not read chapter 3 yet. Okay, I'm just giving you a snapshot of what's going on. So chapter 3, verse 1. It's up on the screen here, or you can follow along in your Bible. Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimuth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him was Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, excuse me, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. The Jeshunah gate was repaired by Joida, son of Pasea, and Meshulam, son of Besodia. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah. Melatia of Gibeon and Jadon of Maranoth, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Forgive me for any names that I butchered there. There's some difficult ones in there, and you can understand why I'm not going to go any further. But I think for where I'm headed with this today, that should give you enough of a picture. Now, Nehemiah chapter 3, if you read through the rest of it, it's an account of how the wall of Jerusalem, the walls were rebuilt, who did the rebuilding, and which family built which part. In fact, that's essentially how the whole chapter is laid out. It tells you who built which piece. This family rebuilt this part of the wall, this family beside them did this. These people put this gate back together, and so forth. This is a good example of the repetition that is present in many Old Testament passages. Now, admittedly, this is not the most gripping and compelling text that you'll find in the Bible. My guess is that as you read through it, it seemed like it droned, it probably felt like I droned on and on there for a while just reading those names. Because you don't, on the surface, it doesn't seem like much is there. But I think that this detail is important to give us some lessons for our lives today. It teaches us a lot about unity, teamwork, and encouragement. So I'm going to touch on four lessons this morning from this passage that you may or may not have focused on before. And so with that in mind, my sermon in a sentence, which is my summary statement for the sermon, is this. The best teamwork comes from men and women who are working independently toward one goal in unison. Now, one of the most amazing accomplishments that occurs in this book 
is the fact that it only took 52 days to rebuild the walls around Jeremiah or around uh, Jerusalem. For my childhood, it seems like it took more than 52 days just to repave the street in front of my house. But they rebuilt the walls of the city. Now granted, there were still a lot of things that needed to be done, but still an amazing feat nonetheless. This was accomplished not by any feat of some modern day technology, but because of the work of everyone together. Now, one thing that we read in chapter 3 is that Nehemiah showed us that the sheer amount of people that were necessary to make this work. He also understood the immensity of the project. He couldn't take it on himself by himself, even if he wanted to. Jerusalem was not a small town like Grove City. It wasn't this small village that just needed to kind of get boxed in real quick. This was a substantial area surrounding a large city. The only way this was going to happen is if people engaged and diligently worked together so that the work could be completed. Because, mind you, don't forget that this wasn't 52 days of peace and no big deal. This is 52 days of guards watching, making sure that people are safe as well as they work. There was risk involved. But it reminds us here of the principle that working together, I've said this many a time and heard many people say this, working together lightens the burdens of the work that God has for us. Many hands, maybe it's, you've heard it said, many hands make light work. Now this is most clearly seen in, in the church environment when the work that the church does relies upon each person here, and even those who are not with us here today, to do their part. For example, take, an, take a ministry that is very common in many churches, Vacation Bible School. Now, countless numbers of these programs happen all over the world. Each person doing that has an un. Uh, an undertaking of ministry of reaching these millions of children every summer. Now imagine if we stopped and said, let's just, let's not, in, you know, let's not, if, or if we had run Vacation Bible or something, you know what, let's just focus on getting one church to do this, they'll do it here, and then they'll hop to all these other cities all over the world until they can meet everybody's ministry needs. Let's not train up others to involve or include others. Let's just do it with one group and make it happen. Wouldn't work very well. Or if we decided today that from now on, we were going to be the only source of gospel ministry that happens in our world. We're not going to have, any in, in, we're not going to have an influence like many that have chosen to, uh, to do ministries in areas that either they grew up in or that they went to, that they felt called to. Now, the way in which these vacation Bible schools happen is because people work together. I was at a church prior that did VBSs, and it required many hands to make those things work. And yet, I went into, and, and just to give you one instance, there's so many examples that I couldn't even count them, but I was talking to someone this past week uh, that lives in Grove City, and very, very, very loosely has a connection to this church. It's been many, many years. But one of the things he said to me was, I came here for vacation Bible school when I was 10. That's a foundational memory that this individual has. Now, I use that as just one example. I don't mean to just point to VBS. That's really true with the ministries that we do. So here's something for us to seriously ponder. And I gotta go back because one thing that I skipped over earlier, but I gotta I'm a math person. That's my background. I came from the math world, so numbers stick in my mind. And that you know, I can't remember most things, but numbers never seem to leave. And the two numbers that stick with me in this is ten and ninety. The ten, does anybody want to guess what those numbers are? And they're related to church. Anybody want to take a guess as to what the 10 and 90 are? 
You have a little hint, because I meant to do this before I got into the, the passage even. 10% to 90% of the work. Yes. In the church, in most churches, 10% of the congregation does 90% of the work. So here's what we need to ponder. So that study, this is a study that's been revealed. It doesn't mean it happens in every church. But let's ponder this for just a minute, because it doesn't just happen in mega churches like we might assume. It happens in small town, rural churches just like this one as well. So let's think about this room. What do you think? I mean, think about what we're trying to accomplish here, and what could that accomplish be if we were 100% working in the same unified direction for one purpose, for Christ's cause and his glory. Think about the evangelistic outreach, the discipleship opportunities, and the vast work that a church could do in order to accomplish the tasks that Christ has laid before us. Now, I want to hit both sides of this for just a minute to make it clear that I am not uplifting the 10% or the 90%. There's work to be done in both areas. First, there's always a need for increased involvement and investment. I was talking with someone yesterday uh, in, around town and they said, you know what I've learned in my life now, finally after all these years, is this life is really about... Uh, it's about people. That's all it's about. It's about connecting and ministering and involving ourselves in the lives of people. So there's always that need. It doesn't just disappear. It doesn't end. We were sitting on the beach yesterday, Emma and I were talking about how many people God has placed in our hearts, both saved and unsaved, that we want to continue to develop and deepen relationship with and share Christ with. But on the other hand, there is a need at times for more refined and clear communication and delegation. So if you're part of that 10%, that, do not, that maybe have been part of the 90% of the work, it's, okay, how do we help delegate and communicate where the needs are and the direction that we're headed? So here's two questions, and these are in your, in your notes that you have with you. Some, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, there's three questions, I guess. I wrote two here. Three questions. These are for you to ask yourself, and you don't have to share them with, with me or anybody other than with God. And that's, in what way are you making the burden lighter here in the work that God is seeking to accomplish? Would you be counted among the 10% or the 90% in terms of your engagement? And then, as I just said a second ago, if you're in that 90%, the question that you ought to ask is, how can I involve myself more? And if you're in that 10%, normally, if that's your normal modus operandi, then you need to ask the question, how can I better delegate what is going on here and include and encourage and train and walk alongside with those to help do ministry together. Secondly, and this is a real obvious one, work goes faster when everyone works together. Now, 52 days is an astonishing amount of time for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Now, granted, they weren't starting from scratch. They were rebuilding partial walls. But we get the description in Nehemiah chapter 1 that the walls were in very poor shape. When people work together, there is a speed that cannot be accomplished alone. Two people working together can mow a lawn over twice as fast as a single person. Ask anyone you like who's gone to a seminar, seminar on productivity, and they will tell you that five people working together will always accomplish more than five individuals doing work. Work goes faster when we are engaged together. And that's vividly shown in Nehemiah chapter 3. And it remains true today. Now I'm not simply saying 
Let's get more people here so we can stack the chairs up faster or get tables set up for our potluck or chairs or all that. Those are part of it. But how quickly can visitation or evangelism or ministering to the needs of others be done when we work together? Let's face it, in our world, we have a lot to try to accomplish with Christ's leading. Christ has called us to a lot. And it's work that might not ever get done at the, at the rate we are going. Let me remind you that Jesus, when he introduced the church, when he called the church, he, he called us to be a moving entity that not even the gates of hell could stand against. But if all the church doesn't stand and take up the work that we are each called individually, it's very difficult to even have enough momentum to ring the doorbell. Now, I do not share this today to bring people down. But it's my hope today that as we get through the rest of this, you'll be encouraged so that we can work together and that we're doing so, as I said before, for the glory of God. Because when we labor in unity for our Savior, not only is the work glorious and beneficial and go quicker, those are just fruitful, fruitful times of fellowship and community. So here's a few more questions for you to think about and take with you. I think Doug will appreciate these ones and a few others, others of you too, but... So you think about grease or glue in an axle. So are you acting like grease in the axles or glue? How can I help the work of the church and in turn help my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ do what needs to be done? And then maybe this last one is the most direct, but it's what is my place? What is your place in the church and am I where I need to be? You know, one of the things that's kind of a, we're, we're still coming out of, if you will, a strange time where things were not really happening. So it's, we're restarting, but we're also kind of reinitiating in a sense because it had been, I think, and you'd have to forgive me, I don't know exactly the time frame of when you guys stopped doing some of the different ministries last year, but it's been probably a year's worth of time roughly. So, in some ways, it's almost like starting from scratch. Not completely, but you have elements in there. So, it's where is your place? Because I can tell you right now, in a church this size, all hands are needed. And it's not just throw you in wherever, you, wherever we feel like it's best. It's a partnership. It's a unified front towards bringing the kingdom of God to the world. Third, each person's work is vital. Now, as you're reading through Nehemiah chapter 3, you maybe thought, wow, Jerusalem has a lot of gates. It's true, Jerusalem did have a lot of gates back then. Some were less prestigious than others. And my guess is that if you didn't have the book in front of you and you hadn't read it, very few of you could name more than two or three of them. Now, if you look at it from a construction standpoint, there is no wall more or less important than another. They could have rebuilt the entire wall structure and left out one gate, and it would have impacted the entire safety. Now, having said that, I might say by name alone, I might have preferred to be working on the fountain gate rather than the dung gate, but all were important. They all had to be built or rebuilt because otherwise Jerusalem would not be safe. The same is true for the work of the church and the work that we do in the service of God Almighty. Sometimes the tasks that we are called to do seem small, insignificant even, like bringing a neighbor over a gate gates to put around their family. You know, it seems like it's insignificant. 
or saying, or saying a word to someone who needs to hear, or listening to someone when they just need someone present. It seems insignificant in the moment. Maybe just sitting in silence. But they need that maybe in that time. Now I think of a story about, if I were to tell you that someone spent countless hours learning how to conjugate verbs or sentence structures of another language, you might think, well, that's a waste of time. When you're in the midst of that, it can be really frustrating and monotonous because it's not exciting at all. And it seems like this is a waste of my time. Why am I doing this? But then you zoom out and you understand that the context here is that even though there are no earth-shattering events that are taking place while you learn how to conjugate sentences, or to structure sentences and conjugate verbs, that this is leading into an individual who is working on becoming a missionary and is learning another language. And they need to know how to understand how to speak the language fluently enough so that they can go to these people and bring the good news of Christ. Now it doesn't seem so small anymore. God uses the little things often to bring about incredible events. Like CPR. Like having someone position, people positioned in the exact locations they needed to be for the rescue of Ralph. In and of themselves, none of those things were particularly amazing. I mean, the CPR is a great tool to use, but these are all man things. But you put them all together, and all of a sudden, you see God working in unbelievable ways. Now, maybe right now, particularly when it comes to ministry, you feel like you're just doing small things, and that's, that's maybe unsettling to you. And maybe it feels like you're the one that's been assigned the duty of build, rebuilding the dung gate. But I assure you, even if you don't see a purpose in it, you can never fully grasp what God is doing in that work. Every aspect of ministry has untold value to the purposes of God. Remember that the next time you feel like you're down and out or that you can't do anything that's worthy of, of, of praise from, or, or of, uh, of, of benefiting God's kingdom, remember these things. God uses the small things to do the great things. Think about David and Goliath. Think about the feeding of the 5,000. Just, don't, I mean, when you get to the, surf, uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000, it's just, here's some fish, here's some loaves. He's using ordinary principles until he does his miraculous work. We know in Romans chapter 8, a lot of people's, one of their favorite verses, verse 28, that we know that all things work together in God's great plan. And we are also reminded in a critical context or a critical passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that every part of the body of Christ is vital. It's necessary. And finally, each person needs encouragement for their work. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up here and, and move through this, but the last thing I want to say on this, I know that this encouraging thing is not natural for me. I'm not a natural, go out of my way. I have to really work hard to intentionally encourage people. There are others, there are many in this room that I have seen that gift come. Either It's either more natural or they've worked harder at it. And they do a great job. That encouragement is necessary. Now, this last point about needing encouragement is especially important for those of you with children or anyone that's in position to praise someone for the work they do. We all need cheerleaders at times. Not the ones that are going to just inflate our ego, but ones that are telling us we're doing a good job and to keep up the good work. 
Nehemiah chapter 3 stands as a record of those who did the work. But I bet it also encouraged the men to know that their names were being written down, that they were being recognized for the work that they were doing. I suspect that they worked a little bit harder when they realized that pages of their account would be names that would go live on, that we'd be reading, even to this day. So let me encourage each one of you, whether you're in the camp, like, like my wife Emily, who's very good at encouraging, or whether you're naturally in my camp where encouraging is it's just not something you naturally think to or gravitate to, we got to do it. Encourage one another. Parents, build up your children and praise them when they serve the Lord. Leaders, encourage and recognize those in the congregation that have worked diligently. Be a cheerleader that the work of God may continue and that the servants of God may not lose heart. Discouragement is a reality that people face many places. The world, as, as, a, as a believer, there is discouragement laid at your feet all of the time. People will tell you that what you're, the journey that you're on is pointless. They'll tell you that your efforts are futile, that you're just going to all end up in the same place anyway. Discouragement is, is like... Uh, I'm sorry, discouragement is a reality just like taxes and gas prices. The sad fact is that we need to take notice of the environment of encouragement and healthy cheering to help people, help other brothers and sisters to act and make it happen. How much more are we desiring to be a part of things when we know we are being encouraged in our journey? The Christian church the home, and places where we are as believers to be, are to be places where the spirits, or where people's spirits are lifted up. I shared a quick story in Sunday school this morning about an individual at Grand Valley State University years ago. It's been almost 20 years ago. And I shared the story about how whenever I would come into this person's presence, it was very clearly and obviously the joy of God. Just being around the individual, you could feel it being exuded very clearly. It was like a light in a dark world. That is how we are to be. So let me end by giving some advice. And I know I'm not the person maybe best suited to give this advice, as I've already admitted to you, encouragement is something I have to really work at. So this advice is for me. Maybe more than you. First, be on the lookout for those who you can encourage. Because you'll be surprised how many people need a word of encouragement. Regularly encourage those who are in the habit of serving God. I think of, as some examples, the Sunday school teachers. Those of you leading Bible studies and those of you that are taking part in various committees, work, and all of those things that are happening. Those of you that are ministering, maybe not in the formal church sense, that are ministering faithfully to your neighbors. And you maybe don't know what to say to them, but what you need is encouragement that God will work through you. One great way to do this. And... Uh, Tim must have gone downstairs. I, you know, I got to encourage or be thankful for, for the presence of Tim Bergstrom and his desire and willingness to, to, to write notes and cards. Here's a, here's a guy who needs to train each of us maybe in the, the art of, of communication in that way. Little things that, that might not seem like a big deal, but they carry uh, the weight worth in gold. Finally, make, a, make complimenting and encouraging something that you do often. So that when you get to the end of your life, you won't have any regrets about never taking the initiative to encourage one another. Just one simple word of praise or acknowledgement can change the course of someone's life. So don't be timid to do it. Just do it. I'll be right back tomorrow.
Oh, pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word and, and the fact that you give us principles and promises to live into, Lord. And one of these principles is the principle of, uh, of growing together and, and, and working alongside another, rubbing shoulders together, whether it be in manual labor or even in fellowshipping as we will here shortly while eating food. Lord, I'm reminded again of my message from last February when we first came up here about our need to do our part. Lord, we aren't to be responsible for others' parts they're, they're, uh, when it comes to the gospel, but we are to do ours. Lord, help us to be found at work uh, building your, the walls of the faith, Lord, and that those walls being um, those of us who need, who need you, Lord. And we, we know that desperately we, we all need your grace. Lord, we thank you um, for your presence in our lives. And we ask for courage, Lord. Sometimes the courage comes in the, in, in the little things, the being willing to, uh, to encourage one another for who they are and what they've done, Lord, and how they are continuing to work for you, Lord, that we are reminded that we are not to do so uh, blindly and uh, just to, to make people feel better, but out of genuineness for the way that God is growing them up. Lord, it is easy to criticize, but much uh, much more difficult, but much more beneficial to encourage. So help us to be a people of an encouraging word as we go forth from this place, that we can uh, bring your truth to a world that needs it, but also to encourage one another, even as we deal with the daily challenges that this life offers. We thank you for each person here, and we pray that you bless you bless their, their lives and, and help them to be a blessing to those whom they come into contact. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you please stand for the benediction and then the closing song. And just one reminder again, even if you didn't bring food, we'd love to have you stick around and, uh, and uh, fellowship with us. Now the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, the great who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory now and forever.